So thank you very much for inviting us. We've been looking very much forward to being here today. Um, so in this primer, uh, I'm going to be, uh, give an introduction to a number of topics that's going to serve as background, background material for, for our main talk. Um, some of the topics are, I'll be presenting, uh, um, th those will be presented in more details here than in the main talk, and, and uh, some of the topics I'll be, or we will be presenting uh, will give more like historical perspective on, uh, on, on the main talk. So just to, just to get started, I got the uh, one slide on what are proteins in case of the some non-biologists in the audience. So proteins, they are linear chain of amino acids. They fold up into complex 3D structures once, once they're exposed to a water environment. One of the main driving forces in the folding process is that the, that the, hydro, um, that the hydrophobic uh, amino acids are shielded from, uh, from, the, uh, from the environment and the hydrophilic uh, amino acids are placed at the uh, close to, to, to the solvent. So they fold up to complex uh, 3D structures that minimizes uh, the, the, free, the free energy and, and normally uh, the function is largely determined by the, by the 3D structure. So if you want to figure out what a protein does, you need to determine its 3D structure. And, and experimental methods are, are difficult and time consuming and, and expensive. So there's a lot of interest in, in computational methods because they, they can offer fast, uh, fast and, and inexpensive uh, alternatives. So one of the, one of the um, uh, what we're going to look at in this primer and, uh, and in the main talk is the structure, the sequence structure function relationships uh, in, in proteins. So just to set some notation, and I'll call the, the amino acid sequence for F, I'll call the fold or the three-dimensional structure for, uh, for X, and then I'll denote F by some feature or some property of, uh, of the molecule. So it could, for instance, be a feature like the, like the secondary structure you could calculate from the sequence, or it could be a feature like intermatic activity of, of, of an enzyme. So ideally, if we want to want to investigate this uh, sequence structure function relationship, we want to learn from a probabilistic perspective. We want to learn the joint distribution over the the sequence, the fold, and and the feature space or, or the, the the feature property space. This is of course highly intractable. So over the last uh, many decades, people have looked at a number of different uh, sub problems, uh, and what. So they, they're all challenging, but the, but the first class here of, uh, of problems is, is an area where uh, a lot of work been done and where we are really far. And that's, uh, for instance, predicting the fold from the sequence or predicting function or features uh, from the sequence. And that's, uh, I'm going to cover uh, some, some, uh, some historical perspective uh, and some, 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 uh, some, uh, some, uh, some of the methodology that's used in, in, in this space in, in a couple of slides. Another set of subproblems is the subproblems where you have the, have the structure and then you want to predict the sequence or secret var variation from the structure or you want to uh, predict function from the structure. That's going to be, that's going to be what Vaudo is going to talk about later on in this primer. It's also going to be the main topic of, uh, of, uh, of our main talk. And finally, there's, uh, there's, uh, these, these two problems that are more related to protein design. That is, if you know the, the features, some features or properties of a protein, then you want to be able to predict the structure of the sequence. And these are very challenging problems that have been done, been, uh, people are doing a lot of work on, on these problems, but it's not something we're going to cover at all in, in this primer and this talk. Uh, so the traditional way of, of inve investigating sequence structure or, or function relationship is using molecular force fields. So molecular for force fields, they've been developed over multiple decades, uh, and they're basically the workhorse or, or the traditional workhorse uh, in computational structural biology. Um, so they can be used to, to address many of, of the, these, uh, these aforementioned uh, uh, subproblems from, from the previous slide. And basically, it allows, if you have some con configuration of a molecule, it allows you to calculate the potential energy of, of the molecule. It's normally divided into a, a bonded and a sum of terms. Some, some relates to, to bonded interactions, and some of them relates to, to non-bonded interactions. For instance, you have, have uh, Leonard Jones potentials for, for Van der Waals forces. So once you, once you have a molecular force field, then you can calculate the potential energy of, of your molecule. 
but if you want to do inference, you need to have some distribution or, or some probability distribution related to what's the probability of finding a uh, molecule in a given configuration. And st standard way you convert these uh, potential entities into probabilities is that you use a uh, Boltzmann or Gibbs distribution. So take the exponential of minus beta, where beta is the inverse, or the inverse temperature, um, and then you multiply it by the energy of the molecule. But this, this, this probability distribution is still highly intractable, uh, at least analytically, and, and that's mainly because you've got uh, the, the, um, the denominator here, you've got the, well, the normalization constant or the partition function. And actually, if you want to calculate that, you need to integrate over the whole configuration, you need to, to integrate this guy here over the whole configuration space. So you can't really do analytic inference in, in this distribution, so you have to, to resort to some kind of approximate inference uh, methods or simulation methods. And two of the predominant, traditionally predominant simulation methods are, are molecular dynamics and Marco Chain Monte Carlo. And the main aim for both of these methods is that you want to generate uh, samples from this di distribution up here. So the conditional distribution of the structure given, given the sequence. It's basically the distribution that takes you from sequence to to the structure. And uh, both Varda and me have been, been for, for, for a decade, we've been working on, uh, on Monte Carlo methods for doing inference in, in these systems we're using, using false fields. So I'm just going to quickly review how one would do inference in a system like this with uh, Monte Carlo inference. The problem is that, that even just sampling directly from this uh, Gibbs or Boltzmann distribution is also intractable. So we need to set up some, some, some scheme for actually generating samples from, from, uh, from this distribution. And the standard solution in, in MCMC inference is that you construct a Markov chain that has got this uh, Boltzmann distribution as stationary distribution. And the most simple algorithm is, is, uh, is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. And the idea in the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is that you have some other distribution that you can sample from. And so the idea is this, this proposal distribution is proposing some change to the state of, of your molecule. The idea is if I got some configuration of my molecule here, then I can sample a change to, that, uh, to the state of, of this molecule from the proposal distribution. It could be that, uh, that I propose that this dihedral, dihedral angle right here should be turned in, in a, certain, uh, certain, uh, certain, uh, uh, a certain number of degrees, and that gives me a proposed structure that, that looks uh, that, that's basically some, some change to this structure right here. And then, then the, the chain proceeds uh, the following way that either I accept this chain, uh, this, uh, this proposed chain with, uh, with this acceptance probability or reject it. So either uh, with, with a certain probability the, 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 the state of the system changes and with a certain probability it stays in, in the same state. And basically you just keep running this algorithm over and over again and you get a number of samples from, uh, from, from, your, from your Boltzmann distribution. Um, once we have these samples, uh, so we imagine that we generated samples from this, uh, this distribution, then we can, uh, then we can perform, uh, based on these samples, we can make Monte Carlo estimates. So we've, if we've got some, some uh, if we want to estimate uh, the mean value of some function over our samples, then we can do that using, using a standard Monte Carlo estimate. So if we want to integrate some function of our structure multiplied by our Gibbs distribution, we can simply do it by evaluating this function in all our samples and then taking, uh, taking the mean of the function. And using Monte Carlo estimates, that allows us, uh, us to calculate the normalization constant and actually calculate probabilities, assign probabilities to different points in, in our configuration space. And that also allows us to, for instance, predict the native structure of the molecule. So this is an example over here where we projected this probability distribution into two dimensions. And the idea is that if we look at the most likely, if you look at the mode of the distribution here with the most likely structures, we'll actually find the, the native structure in, in, uh, in the mode here. And the same is the case over here. We find the native structure in, in the major mode over here. Um, and the, do, well, once we've done this, uh, done a Monte Carlo simulation, it also allows us to estimate therm thermodynamic quantities such as the Hemsholt free energy, heat capacity, and so on. So we also use it to to say something uh, something something more general about the system. One problem is that I presented the the, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm here, and if you just run that on a standard protein system, it's, it's actually it, it, it would take very long time to convert. So you have to use a much more advanced Monte Carlo methods if you actually really want to want to sample systems. And one of the challenging things is that even if you run really long Monte Carlo simulations, it's actually hard to get get good estimates of of, for instance, free energy. 
So some force fields, uh, uh, or some, 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 uh, some of these molecular force fields, for instance, Rosetta and Foldex, they're actually parametrized in a way so we can direct, directly calculate free energies and we don't have to do it through Monte Carlo simulations. And then, well, we don't have to, to make these Monte Carlo estimates, rather we can do long optimization runs and just find, find the, the, the structure with the lowest free energy directly because, because that's the way the, the force fields are parameterized. One thing we can use these, uh, these force fields for is, for instance, we can look at uh, what's the effect of, uh, of a mutation. How does a mutation in a protein affect the stability of the protein? And the way we normally uh, quantify that, this is that we look at, uh, at the stability of, of, a wild, of the wild side of, of our protein. It's normally measured by, by the, the change in Gibbs free energy. So we basically calculate the, the, free, the free energy for, for the unfolded state and the folded state for our wild type. And then we take the difference to get, the, get, the, get the, an estimate of the stability of the protein. Then, then we look at some, we, we, for instance, we mutate one side in the protein and then we also calculate the stability of, of the mutant. And if you then take the difference between the stability of the wild type and the mutant, you get this quantity called delta delta G, which is a measure of, of the change of stability caused by, uh, by, by, uh, by, uh, by a mutation. And if this delta delta G is positive, that means that the mutation is destabilizing uh, uh, the molecule, and if it's if 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 it's negative, it means it has a stabilizing effect. Um, and we will return to the main talk. So, so in the main, this is something we'll re return to our main talk. Uh, how we can how can we use other methods than molecular force fields to to calculate change in stability. So generally, molecular force fields works really really well, and it's been one of the one of the major breakthroughs in in uh, in. Uh, in molecular modeling is actually getting molecular force fields to a state where they can actually perform reliable predictions for, for, small, uh, for small molecules. So there's an example here of a number of small proteins where, you, where the predicted and the, and the experimental measure structure are very close to each other. Um, however, there's some drawbacks to, to molecular force fields. First of all, inference methods are still very computationally expensive. You have to run really, really long simulations to predict uh, to get, get good predictions and, and good estimates of, of thermodynamic properties. Um, another thing is that if we actually want to learn these force fields from data, that's, that's even more computational demanding. These knowledge space potentials has, has gone a, got a very long history and it's something people are working a lot on, especially this right now there's some happening, some really, really interesting development in speeding up uh, learning force fields for, for, for quantum-based force fields. Uh, but it's still it's very very computation demanding actually actually learning these classical physical force fields. There's another challenge, and that is that uh, that even if we know this the, the, the distribution over, over the structure given the sequencing, it might still be very hard to say something about function because it might be very hard to actually construct mis uh, physical models for function. For instance, constructing physical models for for enzymatic activity. That, this, this is still a very challenging problem. So. So one question is, couldn't we actually do direct, direct predictions where we directly predict the, the quantity we are interested in without using these molecular force fields? So basically, is there some way without a force field for, to go from the sequence to the structure? And generally, we, so, so what, what we're asking is, is, could we find some function that's basically directly mapping from sequence to function or from, se so from sequence to structure or from sequence to function? And generally, if, if we take the machine learning hat on, we want to find some function approximator. And, and one thing we, from machine learning we know is really, really good function approximators uh, is neural networks. And there's been a, a long tradition for using neural networks for actually circumventing force fields and do direct, direct predictions in, in molecular modeling. Uh, some of the early work is on uh, secondary structure prediction. Uh, this, is, this is the work by, uh, here, here I got the work by Holly and, and Kaplis done here in, in Cambridge in, in 88. And the idea here is pre predicting secondary structure directly from, uh, from, uh, from a single uh, amino acid sequence. So uh, the idea is basically in this work that, uh, that they have a small neural network that, where they, that they slide along the amino acid sequence. It's just a, 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 a network with one hidden layer and then the output of the ne network is whether, whether the central amino acid here is, is in a helix or in a sheet. You basically slide this, uh, slide this window over, over your amino acid sequence and you get predictions of, of, of secondary structure. This was done in, in 88 on, on, on a very small data set, and they achieved accuracy around 60%. 
And, and uh, as you'll see in a couple of slides, it's actually surprisingly close to how you do secondary structure prediction uh, today, what, what they did in 88. So some of the, so, so the first work that got secondary structure prediction about, above 70% uh, is, is the work by, uh, by Rust and, and Sanders. Uh, so the idea here is that they, that they, instead of uh, doing a secondary structure prediction from a single sequence, they use, uh, use a sequence alignment of homologous uh, proteins. So this work is known, uh, known under the, word, the, 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 the name PhD. Uh, so some follow-up work was done by David Jones, and the idea in David Jones's work with Cypred is that, that you obtain a multiple alignment using Cypred. Again, you feed this multiple alignment into a neural network, and you get a, a prediction of, of a helix coil or, or sheet. What do you uh, mean a multiple alignment? So a multiple sequence alignment of proteins. So you, you so so uh, so you take a so take a homologous proteins and you perform a multiple sequence alignment. And you feed this multiple sequence alignment into your neural network. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Um, and today, uh, use, using these multiple sequence alignment, we actually you, you can actually uh, achieve more than 80% accuracy in doing a protein secondary structure prediction. This is uh, this is uh, the work of of uh, Wood's group in uh, out of uh, Chicago. And if you look at the, this is the neural network that they use in, uh, in, uh, for doing secondary structure prediction. And it's surprisingly similar to what was done in, 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 in Kaplis' work from, from 88. The main difference is that rather than having a fully connected network that you slide along the sequence, then you have a con convolutional neural network where you're sliding filters along the sequences. And another, so another change is that, that the network has got more hidden layers and also that, that, that this is significantly more training data. And with this, with this, this there's a lot of work, work uh, done in this area and, and most of the methods get, get accuracies above uh, 80%. Um, so this, this idea about using the deep learning methods, particularly a convolutional neural network, is some, some, something we see uh, a lot uh, across, uh, across, uh, across the community. There's, for instance, the work by Brendan, Brendan Frey's group, where they use uh, convolutional neural networks to, to uh, predict, um, uh, uh, predict uh, DNA or RNA binding sites in, in proteins. Uh, and the idea is here, here they feed in the genomic sequences, but again, they feed it into uh, a convolutional neural networks, and, and they are actually able to, to predict sequence, uh, sequence locus for, for the binding sites of, of, uh, of uh, DNA and, and RNA. Um, so these, these, these first things I talked about was, was how can we use the sequence to say something about secondary structure, and this is something, how can, use, uh, how can we use the, the primary sequence to say something about, uh, about function? If we want to move closer to three-dimensional structure, then there's been done a lot of work on, uh, on, uh, on looking at correlation, uh, doing correlation analysis of, of sequence alignments. So the idea is basically, if we, if we see a, a pair of mutations that are correlated, then it, it's, 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 a, it's very in, in a multiple sequence alignment, then it's very likely that those two, uh, two, uh, two amino acids are in contact or, or, or performing some function together. And, and uh, this work started back in, in the 90s, 90s, even the 80s. And one of, one of the big breakthroughs was, was done by, by Deborah Marx and, and Chris Sander, uh, where they actually learned to distinguish between uh, things that are causative uh, related and then things that are indirectly related. So the idea is that if you, if you analyze multiple sequence alignment and you see that, that there's some uh, correlation between A and D, a and B and A and D, you will also observe a, a correlation between B and C. And they came up with, with a method that, that, uh, that we're able to dis distinguish between these type of correlations. So they were actually be able to see that B and C are indirectly correlated through because, because uh, A and D are in contact with each other. And this, this, this is a major break, breakthrough because this allows you to predict a contact matrix. So it allows you to predict which amino acids in a sequence that are actually in contact with each other. And this brings you very, very close to doing three dimensional. So if you combine these uh, contact matrices with force fields, you, you are very close to doing three dimensional uh, structure prediction. This also then, again, uh, Jim Baudieu from Chicago then done some work on can we actually refine these contact maps so you looked at if you take uh, if you take a sequence profile, so if you take a multiple alignment, and you also take in uh, some of these uh, contact maps coming coming out of uh, 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 of uh, correlation studies, and then you feed that into a neural network, you actually get very very high accuracy in predicting uh, contact maps. 
Um, so this, this brings us very close to, to a three-dimensional structure prediction without false fields. And lately, within, within the last year, there's been some very interesting developments in, in actually doing, going all the way from sequence to three-dimensional structure. There's the work by, by John, John Ingham, Ingham and, and Deborah Marx's group where he's, he's looking at, uh, can we actually learn from, from, from doing backpropagation through uh, full molecular simulations? And, and, and that brings us close, closer to, uh, to, to doing full 3D structure prediction. And there's also the work by, by Mohammed al Qasiri, who's sitting right there, right? <laughs> and he, he's done some very, very exciting work about actually do, using something that looks like an LSTM-style neural network to, to, to do fully differential uh, learning of protein, uh, of protein 3D structure, going all the way from sequence to three-dimensional structure. So what I, what I looked at so far is, uh, can we actually go from sequence to, uh, to structure? So if we know the amino acid sequence, can we then say something about the structure of the protein? Or can we say something about the, the function of the protein? And, 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 and I gave a historical overview uh, view of this, and, and we are really, really far in, in that direction of, of being able to actually predict a 3D structure or, or function from sequence. The next thing we're going to talk about, what if we know the function? What if we experiment, oh, sorry, if we know the structure, if we experimentally determine the structure, what can we say about sequence or sequence variation? Or what, what can we say about function of, of, of the molecule? That's, that's where Vauda is going to take over. <laughs> All right, um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, um, so Yes gave a sort of a historical perspective um, over uh, sort of various topics in structural biology uh, where, and we, we see from many of these, in many of these tasks that convolutions have played an essential role. So they've been, so in a, if you want to develop a purely data-driven uh, model of, uh, of some relationship between uh, structure and, and, and sequence, uh, you can do this by using uh, the feature detection uh, capabilities of convolutional neural networks. And this is even if we look at the other direction, which is if you want to go from um, structure and say something about sequence or say something about function, then this, it turns out that, 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 this, that convolutions play an even more uh, important role, at least uh, the developments over the last year suggest that they, uh, that they can. Um, and for this reason, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, sort of primer over convolutional uh, neural networks. Uh, and some of you, this might be familiar territory to some of you, but, um, uh, and I'll, so I'll do this uh, walkthrough in terms of image analysis where, where these, uh, these models were originally devised. Um, so the idea in image analysis is that you have uh, an image uh, in one end, and on the other hand, you want to make some prediction of, uh, of uh, over this image. Uh, the typical example is that you have images that, and you want to classify, for instance, handwritten digits. You want to classify uh, what, uh, with what probability uh, this input image uh, is a certain uh, digit. Um, and uh, the whole network is basically just a function from this input to that output. Uh, but then these neural networks are typically layered into, uh, into distinct layers. Um, with repetitions of, of different operations of convolutions and nonlinearities and pooling, uh, and ultimately ending up in a fully connected network and then the final prediction. And I'll just walk you through these, uh, these individual components, these ingredients, uh, one at a time, uh, just to give you some background on this. Um, so the first is the sort of the, the, the convolution itself, which is, and the, the idea is here that you have a small filter that you apply to every position in your input image. Um, uh, and, and this produces what is called a feature map um, uh, for a particular filter. So in this case, I have two filters, the red and the green, and they were both slid over the, over the input image, and then they produce two different uh, feature maps. And this is, this is completely standard image analysis. Uh, uh, this is a completely standard image analysis tool. You do, uh, people have been doing this for image analysis for a long time. So what's, what's sort of new in convolutional neural networks is that you try and learn these features automatically uh, from, uh, from data. Uh, so the typical example of these filters could be edge detection filters. Uh, so for instance, detecting edges at different or, uh, orientations. Um, and so you will see, for instance, uh, you see the edges being detected in these feature maps. Um, right. So the, these, this 
operation, this, uh, this com uh, convolution operation is really quite a simple uh, operation. There's not much magic going on there. So if you have a certain filter, uh, which looks like this, and an image like this, what you basically do is you, you place the filter on the image at all positions and then just calculate the dot product between the, between the entries in your filter and the, and the entries in the image. Uh, so when you run it along here, you will see that when there's no overlap between the filter and the image, you get a zero. Uh, but then uh, if there's overlap between the filter and the, so basically there's a correlation between the, the filter and the image, you will start seeing, uh, so you will generate a feature map like this. Um, and so this, as I mentioned, this is technically speaking just a, a correlation, and people typically refer to it as, as convolutions because that's the, 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 that was the, the operation used typically in image analysis, which is where you actually uh, transpose the filter afterwards. But when you're learning filters, that, that distinction is not really important. So we'll just refer to these as convolutions, even though they're technically speaking, they're just correlations. Um, so after generating these feature maps, if you just have a number of these layers of convolutions where you generate feature maps and then apply convolutions on these feature maps and do this repeatedly, um, since convolution is a simple linear uh, operation, you will end up with a, a, a linear model. And we really want these, these, uh, these neural networks to give us, to give us a, a nonlinear, to be, to be nonlinear function estimators uh, to increase their expressive power. So somewhere in this, somehow you need to build in nonlinearities in these models. And what you typically do is that you introduce, um, um, that you introduce, uh, after each convolution, you introduce a nonlinearity. Um, and the, one of the typical examples is, uh, so these can be really quite simple. So one typical example is the rectified linear unit, where you basically take a signal and you set everything that's negative in this signal to zero. So for instance, you have this feature map, and if we say that black is, is negative and white is positive, then you just you end up, you set all the, the, the black part of the signal to, to gray. And even though this is a very simple operation, it's enough to turn this model into a nonlinear function estimator and, and, and actually uh, increase the, the expressive power of these models considerably. Okay. So finally, one last ingredient in these models is that you typically do downsampling. Uh, you have downsampling layers in your network uh, where you go from, uh, from, you scale down the image from some, uh, at uh, different stages in the model, you downsample from a large image to a smaller image, either by taking, uh, for each application of, uh, so within the window, you either take a maximum or the, the average, and you downsample uh, to smaller uh, sizes. And the reason for doing this is that, is that you, uh, you reduce, so you have these convolution operators, and then you do uh, pooling here to downsample. And the reason, one of the reasons for doing this is that by downsampling your spatial dimensions, you can afford to have more, uh, more feature maps in memory at the same time. So, you, so what you typically do is you, you decrease the spatial resolution in your model, but then increase the number of filters that you learn. So gradually, you'll be learning more and more abstract uh, uh, representations, uh, and you will be learning more and more of them uh, as you go through the model. And ultimately then, so in, this, in these stages of the model, you'll be learning uh, features automatically in the input image. And then finally, the role of the last part of the model is then to correlate these features that you've automatically detected in the image to the particular output that you're, uh, that you're interested in. And you do, typically do that using a fully connected uh, network in the end. Okay, so it's important to state here that these ideas are not really new. Um, so so uh, these, basically, this type of arch architecture, people were already looking at these these types of models in the late 80s, and, and if you look at a publication, this publication, for instance, from 98, this basic structure is, is, is the same as, as what I just presented. Um, so the reason they're so much more used and popular today and, and that image analysis has seen these, this revolution in the last couple of years is, is for a number of reasons, and, but uh, so, yeah, so one is that we're now able to implement these things on GPUs, uh, and that means we can scale up these networks to much larger sizes. And also, we have much more data available uh, today than we had back then. Um, but the methods themselves are, uh, are, are, are very, um, if, you, if you read these old papers and you're familiar with the literature today, you'll find all these old papers very, very familiar as well. The, the ideas are very similar. Okay, so that was just a brief introduction of convolutions. Now, we really, really want to go back to, to proteins. Um, and where yes left us off was the question of what you, we can say based on 
structure, if we know a structure for a particular protein family, if we know a structure, what can we say about, about uh, sequence variation within this protein family, or if we want some other downstream uh, feature or function of this uh, structure, what can we say about that? And so, so one thing that we've been looking at is, so if you, if you just look at a protein structure, uh, you, the question is, so the question we ask ourselves, couldn't you consider protein structures simply as images in 3D as well? Can't you use all these developments we've seen in image analysis and simply apply them directly on, 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 on these atom positions and then see whether you can learn uh, just from this raw data, whether you can learn these relationships between, between structure and whatever thing you want to predict. Um, and, and so uh, all you, uh, yeah, so what we looked at is, so in a normal image, you have uh, color channels. You have red, green, and blue color channels, for instance, in an image. Um, so in, in, an, um, in a structure, in a protein, you would have, you can imagine different sorts of, of input channels, but one simple way of thinking about it, which is how, where we started at least, was to say, okay, can't we take all the atoms, and, and if we have a, so we, we grid up the whole space into some, some form of grid, either a global grid or, or if we're interested in predicting something locally, maybe a, a grid locally at a certain position. And then we, we just look at each voxel in this grid and we see that if, if there is an atom in this, in this particular voxel, um, we could characterize that atom by, for instance, a mass and a partial charge. So instead of using red, green, and blue color channels, we would just characterize the atoms that e in each voxel by their mass and their partial charge. That would be one way of doing this. Um, now this is, so this is sort of the, this is the topic of our main talk, so I'll be, we'll be going into some depth in this in the main talk uh, later. Um, so I, I just want to give slightly more perspective on this because wh while we've been, we were busy discussing this uh, a year ago, so over the last year, uh, a number of people have gotten the exact same idea. Maybe not so surprising. It seems like a fairly obvious idea. Um, but um, uh, so I just want to illustrate that you could use this idea for a number of different problem domains. So we, uh, as I'll talk, we'll talk about the main talk, we look, we use these types of models to say, to talk about sequence variation, whether we can predict uh, uh, sequence variation from structure. But others have looked at, for instance, can we predict, can we find bindings, the location of promising binding sites on the surface of a protein, uh, or can we, given that we know of, uh, we have a, a complex of a protein and a ligand, can we, uh, you know, so this is the application of trying to find binding sites on the surface of a protein. Um, others have looked at, given that you have a protein and a ligand docking, can we use these convolutional models to predict the binding affinity that these have to one another? Um, and there are several uh, works on that. And, uh, others, again, have looked at uh, using these models uh, to, to classify overall shapes of proteins into different enzymatic classes. Um, and, um, and finally, the work that's maybe closest to our work is, is, uh, is this, where, where they looked at, at local environments around amino acids to, to also say something about sequence uh, variation. So the, the point here is that in all these publications, the, the, the approach is basically the same uh, you can take a standard off-the-shelf neural network from image analysis, you can encode your protein in something that looks like an image, and then you can just run with it, you can train it on some data uh, that, that is relevant to your specific problem domain. So all these different applications, they only differ really in the data it was trained on. The model architectures are basically the same. Um, so this is quite a, a neat way to do, so it seems that Convolutional neural networks can learn the relevant features for these different problem domains as long as you just par parameterize the input correctly. Okay, so, um, um, so one thing I just want to, um, to, to stress about convolutional neural networks is this, the essential property uh, that, that these models rely on is, is that you have uh, translational equivariance. Uh, and this means that if um, so we're learning, uh, convolutional neural networks will learn to recognize different features in the input. Um, but they will do so independent, independently of where the, the input occurs in the, in, uh, the, or the feature occurs in the input. So say that we're, we have a, a neural network that, that learns to recognize cats, for instance. Um, if a cat appears in the upper left corner of the image, it will, it will, uh, it will 
So say this is a cat, it will light up in the feature map in some, in some way. If we then move this relevant feature that we're looking at to a different location in the input image, it will, uh, the, the feature map will shift in the same way. So, uh, so the, the overall uh, um, idea here is that uh, we learn to recognize cats no matter where they appear in the, uh, in the image with the same parameters. So we do parameter sharing, uh, but we still remember when we then see a, a cat at a given uh, specific position in an image, we do remember, we can see in our feature map where it occurred. So it's not invariant to the location, but it just uses the same uh, parameters to, to, to recognize cats no matter where they occur. So this is the, this is the central property of, of convolutional uh, neural networks. Um, and we'll, uh, and the question then is for our particular purpose, so imagine that we want to recognize in protein structures, one could imagine the essential, one of the essential properties in protein structures would be how are atoms connected. Uh, so for instance, can we learn to recognize hydrogen bonds and correlate them with, with some output that we're interested in? And for this purpose, we would expect that we would need to, to recognize hydrogen bonds no matter which or orientation they occur in, in, the, in the input protein. Uh, and the question is whether we can, uh, so the, the, it would be a very nice property if, if we had equivariance with respect to rotations as well. So if we could recognize these features independent of, of rotation, that would be a, a very nice property of these models to have. Now, unfortunately, convolutional models or standard convolutional neural networks do not have this property. Uh, so the question is, can we somehow, uh, can, we, can we construct convolutional neural networks that do have this property? And there's been some very uh, recent work on this, uh, primarily driven by, by Taco Cohen and Mac Max Welling, who have looked into, can you construct convolutional neural networks where you build in properties from specific symmetry groups that you're interested in directly into the, in, into the, the convolutional neural networks? Um, and just to give an example here for 90 degree rotation, so if you want to develop a convolutional uh, neural network that, that, uh, that is equivalent to 90 degree rotations. What they propose, Max Welling and Zachary Cohen, is that you, you take the symmetry group, in this case, this, symmetry, this, uh, this group has four elements, and then you explicitly, corresponding to the four poses that an, that an input image could have, and you explicitly build in this structure into your, uh, into your neural network. So you, you apply your filter at different orientations, and this gives you the different feature, uh, gives you different feature maps. And then you make sure to build this structure, to explicitly represent the structure throughout your convolutional neural networks. Rather than just having a number of, of channels as we did before, you now have channels where, they, where they're grouped in these four elements. So you, at, each, uh, at each stage, you, re you represent these four different poses and you do this throughout your, your, your network. And then you can show that you, you obtain full rotational equivariance with respect to 90 degree rotations. The problem is, of course, that if we want to do, if we want arbitrary rotations, so for any continuous orientation, we want it to be equivariant. This approach sort of breaks down because we can't, we can't explicitly uh, represent all these different poses in our, in our networks. It becomes uh, unfeasible to have that many layers. Um, but one interesting aspect, this is actually this is a quite old result, is that, is that you can think of parametrizing the, uh, the filters in your neural network in, term, in your neural network in terms of uh, uh, sort of a, a, a fixed size basis set of filters. Um, for instance, uh, so here in this case, we have these two, two uh, filters here. And then any rotation of this filter can be expressed in terms of linear combinations of these two uh, to construct any rotation of this. So, so this is a way to get around this, uh, the fact that you have you want to represent all rotations, but you can't do it explicitly. Steerable filters are, are a way to get around this. And the nice thing is, because convolutions are a linear operator, not only can you, can you calculate what a filter will look like uh, as, as a linear combination of these, but you can also predict uh, what, the, what the result will be of doing a convolution just based in terms of the, the convolutions on the basis, on, on, these, on this basis set of filters, you can, you can construct any rotation uh, by, by, by a simple mathematical operation. So this means that you can, uh, you can calculate how the, the, the linear, um, uh, how the feature map will respond when you rotate your input image uh, without having to, to actually represent it explicitly. Yes? Is it possible to 
Is it qualitatively, qualitatively different in frequency? So that's a very good question. Uh, so, uh, so this is, we're going to touch upon this in the main talk. This is, uh, so that, yes, uh, it is different, uh, but it's, it seems to be doable, yes. Um, yes. All right, so, um, so the question is, so this was just for a simple filter applied, it's in a sing single operation to a feature map. Um, the question is whether you can build these types of considerations into neural networks where you repeatedly apply these these convolution operations, and whether you can still r retain this, this steerability where you, you, can, you can directly calculate what the effect will be of rotating the input image. And this... Just a question, though. Are, are you going to come back to where the heck those steerable ones come from? In the, I mean, like, the, the intuition of why those should exist at all, even in 2D, is yes. that something you'll come back to? Or yes, you yes. Take a minute now, or yes. Yeah. yeah, so we'll, we'll get back to this in the main talk. Uh, yeah, yes. Yes? Um, so if you consider like a, you know, a less trivial group like you know SO3, rotation in three yes. dimensions, then okay, we have like two generators, but the relation between rotation matrices and the generators is nonlinear. So how can you like by linear combination of a finite number of filters get all the rotations? Uh, right. So um, I think I'll touch a, li a little bit on this in the main talk, uh, but uh, yeah. So maybe we should we should wait until uh, yeah. Um, right. Uh, so, the, so uh, yes. So uh, the answer to this question is, so whether you can actually uh, do this for entire uh, convolutional neural networks, this has been the topic of a number of recent papers that have shown that this seems to be, uh, to be possible um, uh, for, by using uh, um, uh, circular or spherical harmonics, depending on whether you're looking at two, two or 3D. And we're just going to touch upon this in the, in the main talk uh, later. Right. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, I'll conclude uh, there for now. Yes? So I have one more question. Yes. So what are you actually learning? So are you learning the, the basis vectors, but then how do you know, for an example, how, like what linear comp Yeah, so the basis, so the, the basis filters are fixed. Uh, and then you learn uh, these, uh, uh, you learn the, uh, the, the weights, uh, how you combine them into, uh, into into actual filters. You learn sort of the... I guess what I don't understand is that in each example, there will be a different linear combination, presumably, because there will be a different rotation. Uh, in each example, you mean in the, uh, in the inputs? In the input, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so I guess, okay. Yeah, no, I think, yes. I think I'll talk a little bit more detail in the main talk, and then we can, uh, I think we can have a discussion based on that. Uh, yes? So the best thing you heard here the most, most is that they can fit. Yeah, no, so this is actually, so, uh, yeah, so these are simple, uh, uh, I think these are just, I can't even remember uh, how these filters are constructed. I think they're just derivatives of uh, Gaussians or something. I, I think they're, they're, so these, okay. Okay. All right, so I think uh, we'll conclude the primer here and then uh, move on to the main talk after the break, yeah. All right, so, um, so this is our main talk on convolution models for, for molecular structure. Uh, there's a little overlap for, for those of you who didn't attend the primer. There's a uh, there's a there's a little overlap with 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 the with the primer and the main talk, and, and we apologize for those of who to you to those of you who've been for for both talks. Um, so the main main motivation uh, for for the main talk started uh, um, um, started with some discussions Vauda and I had a, had about a year ago in in a cafe in in Copenhagen. And, and the discussions were around that, that if you take a, a trained biologist or, or biochemist, he can, he can t actually take a look at a protein structure and use his intuition to say, is this a good structure or is this something, something off in this, uh, in this structure? Um, 
And it turns out that in main, so, so traditionally the way you do it is that you can use molecular force fields like we discussed in the primer to say something, is this is a good, is this a good structure, is, is, is there something wrong with this structure? But, but humans can actually still often outperform computers and just actually very quickly just taking a look, take a look, a look at a structure and saying there's something wrong with the position of the side chain or clearly this isn't the binding site or clearly there's a binding site there and so on. And looking at, as, as we discussed in the primer, looking at the revolutions that ha has been happening in image recognition, we discussed, couldn't you, actually, couldn't you actually have computers learning this? Couldn't you have computers actually taking a look at, at a protein, just like an image, zooming into it, and, and then looking at it, looking at the atoms within the molecule and saying, oh, there's something sitting incorrectly here, and so on. Because you can train, you can train computers to, to recognize uh, images or doing image recognition at the level of human performance. Couldn't you actually train computers to, to assess uh, protein structures or say something about protein structures by looking at, at protein structures like just as if they, they were, ima were images. Um, so, uh, so, so the way, like, like we also discussed in the primer, the way that uh, um, the way that we're actually doing image recognition is, is based on, on feed-forward neural networks. And I'll just give a one slide introduction, a more theoretical introduction to, to feed-forward neural networks. So a feed-forward neural network is basically just a mapping. It's a, uh, it's a function that maps x to some output y. And they, they, for feed-forward neural networks are excellent function approximators. So if we just observe some data, we, re, we can really well approximate the, the, this actual mapping. Um, they're normally constructed as a function composition of simpler functions. So basically, we write this function as a func function composition of a number of simpler functions, where each of these functions in, in a fully connected layer is assumed to have this functional form. So basically, we take the input when we when we um, perform a, a linear transformation where this is uh, where, where this is a weight and this is a bias, and then what comes out of the linear transformation, we pass that through some nonlinearity. And the, this nonlinearity is often also called an activation function, and, you know, and, and the most simple one is, is the one called a rectified linear unit, and it's basically just the max of zero and whatever is coming out of this linear transformation. Uh, that's the most simple, one of the most simple, simple nonlinear functions you can think of, and that's actually sufficient to, to introduce, uh, introduce nonlinearities in, in deep neural networks. Um, Normally we draw the networks like this. We got the input right here. We got this nonlinear transformation and the sum as, as these, uh, these units right here. We pass it through some nonlinearity. Then we got a linear transformation and we got the output. So this is just a drawing of, of a two layer, layer neural network. The way we learn the parameters or, or the weights and the biases of these networks is basically that if we got some examples or some data set of, of x's and y's, then we minimize the law, some loss function and one example could, for instance, be the L2 loss, which is basically the squared difference between uh, the observed y and the predicted y. We basically just uh, minimize the, the sum over the, the, the square losses, and we norm normally you do that using gradient descent uh, techniques. For instance, stochastic gradient descent is one of the most popular methods to, to train, uh, train neural networks. Like Valder discussed in, 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 uh, in the primer, when we want to apply neural networks to image recognition, we don't use these uh, fully connected layers. We use, uh, we use some parameter sharing, and we slide filters over our neural network to produce feature maps. So we do the sliding of filters to produce feature maps. We use pooling to downsampling this feature map. And normally, we stack these together some more convolutions, pooling, and so on. And then normally, the standard design is that one should once you've done uh, convolutions and downsampling, then you have some fully connected layers that then giving you, uh, giving you the output. In this case, we have a softmax normalization, so it gives a distribution over some, uh, some uh, it basically gives a categorical distribution as, as output. So if you weren't for the primer, then what's the primer for, for more details on, on CNNs? Um, but I'll just show, uh, show uh, actually a live example instead of, of how uh, um, uh, CNN works for, for image recognition or for, for, for recognizing digits. So this is just a small animation. If I input, for instance, the number two, then there's a small network here trained to recognize, uh, recognize numbers. So this is my input. Then I, got the, then I got the filters here. This is basically illustrating the filters that I'm sliding over my input image down here. And this is producing, in this case, six different feature maps. Then we have the pooling here that's downsampling the feature maps. Then we have the next layer here, we're sliding filters over all our, 
all our feature maps produce new feature maps, downsampling, and then we got, got two dense layers right here. And then we got an output distribution. In this case, the most likely uh, category is, is a two, just like, like, like a drawn. And one thing we can also observe here when we look at, uh, look at, uh, at, the, at the, the small demo is that the further we get away from, from the input, uh, 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 if we look at the feature maps further away from the input, close to the input, the feature maps looks very much like, like the input. And then as we get further away, and this is a general tendency, we have more and more abstract feature maps. So it's a more and more abstract way of, of describing uh, our image. Like Vaud also mentioned, then, uh, then uh, one of the key features of, of CNNs is this translation equivariance. It basically means if I have a picture of a cat, if I translate the cat and then apply a convolution, so imagine I have a filter that can actually recognize cats, then the filter will, if I, if I apply a tra translation and uh, apply the convolution, then the filter will light up here at the position of, of the cat. If I did the opposite array around, if I first applied the convolution, the filter is recognizing the cat up here, and then translating this, uh, uh, this feature map, then I end up with the same, same, uh, same, um, with the same feature map. So this is a very important, this is an important uh, uh, property of, of CNNs. And it basically, like Vaud also described, it means basically we have, if we have a filter that can recognize the cat, it can actually recognize it independently of the position in the image, but it will actually still remember the position of the cat in the image. So we still get in the feature map the, the actual position, but we apply the same filter to, to recognize cats. So let's return to proteins again, because, um, uh, because the mo main motivation was, couldn't we actually use C CNNs for doing, uh, for, 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 for recognizing or assessing the quality of proteins or saying something about the properties of the proteins? Uh, so the approach we took is, let's look at the environment, let's, let's take a protein structure and then look at the environment around a single amino acid. So can we actually, if we look at the environment around this amino acid, can we say something about the properties of the protein or, or, or can we say if there's something, is this a good protein structure or, or a bad, bad protein structure? Um, so, so the way we, we did it is, so, if, so first of all, if, if we want to train a CNN to make these predictions, we need to decide what is going to be our input rep representation. So we decided to, to place a, a, a 12 angstrom ball in the central C alpha atom of the amino acid, and then, then we basically represent the whole molecule by, uh, uh, by, the, by the, 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 the atom positions around this, uh, this C alpha. So we have, uh, we have uh, oriented coordinate system in there that's oriented according to, uh, according to the backbone. So we always have uh, one of the axes pointing along the backbone and one, one axis pointing towards, towards the side chain. So the idea is that when we feed this into our neural network, the, the image is always oriented in the, in the same way. So this ball here, we gridded, uh, we gridded up using a standard Cartesian grid where the size of the voxels is half uh, an angstrom uh, times half an angstrom times ha half an angstrom. And the point of gridding it up in this way is that then we only have at most one atom falling within each voxel. Um, and then, like Vaud also mentioned, then we use... Uh, oh. Just to be clear, um, we're measuring X, Y, Z. Yes. We're X, Y, Z, not... not local angles, angles. No, in this case, we're actually using the teaching coordinates. We'll actually get back to, 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 to uh, that you can actually me measure the heat length of the instead. Vaudo will call that, uh, cover that in the second part of the talk. Okay. So you're only just doing some global, some global alignment with... Uh, and so we have global... Because right. you, mentioned, you mentioned the first coordinates along the backbone. The no, 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 so we... Have, we, we no, so we actually we actually place a coordinate system just just in, in the cent, in the central C alpha where you got one axis pointing along the along the along the side chain, one pointing towards the uh, towards the we side chain. We use that coordinate system. Yes, yeah, so we use that for for the individual amino acids. So we have a different coordinate system for each of the amino acids. Oh, we do. Yes, we do have an individual coordinate system for each of the amino acids. So the input to the neural network will be one. Uh, so, so one data point is 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 is, uh, is the coordinate system for a single amino acid, and then some some output the target that we want to want to learn something about. Okay, your input is only a single. It's only a single amino acid. So we have a have a reference frame for, for each amino acid. Uh, and then we have two, just like you, like you have uh, in, in, in a color image, you've got three input channels, uh, uh, red, green, and blue. Then we've got two input channels. We've got, uh, we got the mass and we've got the par partial charts of, of each atom. So that's basically, we've got we two input channels for, 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 
uh, for a network. And that's this is this is like a like a schematic illustration of the type of neural networks we we use because of course when we look at images we're doing 2D convolutions where, whereas now we're going to do 3D convolutions. And the main difference between doing uh, 2D and 3D convolutions in three dimensional space is that now your filter is not uh, it's not a square, it's actually a box and you're sliding this box around in in uh, in, in a larger box rather than around the image. So you've got these input channels, uh, these two input channels, partial charts and mass, and then we perform convolutions with activation functions. We use pooling, standard pooling to downsample our image, and normally use max pooling in, uh, for image recognition, but in this case, we actually use some pooling because both partial charts and mass are naturally additive uh, physical quantities, so it makes sense that if you want to downsample the image, you can actually just add together the masses that, that are within, uh, uh, within a box of, box of pixels. Um, so we perform from these convolutions, pooling, downsampling, we have, have many of these layers, and then we got some fully connected layers towards the end. And the idea is that whatever property we want to predict about this environment, we can have that as, as the output or the target distribution. So the actual uh, architecture of the networks we use uh, looks like this. So we got uh, got uh, seven layers. We got the input layer, and then we got the output layer here with with a soft max rather than a ReLU at the end. And then we got a combination of some pooling, three D convolutions, and and dense layers in in our network. Yes. And what is the output that you're you're trained to or trying to assess? That's exactly what I'm going to cover now because we we try to train this on on different tasks. And the first one that we try to do is. Can we actually, it's more like a sanity check, the first check. The first check is basically, can we actually learn secondary structure assignment? So, so uh, when, you have a, when you have a protein structure, then you, got, uh, then you can use a force field to assign secondary structure. So you can, for instance, say that, that this amino acid here is part of the helix, the, these amino acids up here is part of a sheet, or the, and those sitting over here is, is part of, of, of coil regions. Uh, and this is, this is done with a simple force field, but it's basically just a function that you apply, you calculate on, on your three-dimensional structure, and it gives you out the, the secondary structure. So we actually, we just want to test, we actually learn this, this function. Can we actually approximate this function with this three-dimensional, this 3D CNN network? Um, so, so it's not, it's not, yes? So I'm clear on the requirement for empirical observation to inform that training. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear about the uh, requirement for like empirical uh, observation, scientific experiment, biological experiment, uh, determining structures. Yes, for, uh, so for the training. Uh, for the training. Uh, so in this case, we need a, we need yes, we need three D structures. So we should use crystal structures for to 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 do the training here. So basically, when we train these ones, we have as as input here, we take a, we take a crystal structure, then we calculate the the secondary structure assignment, and then the input is going to be that uh, for each amino acid position, we input the environment, and the output is then going to or the target distribution is going to be which secondary structure was assigned to to this amino acid. So you have the crystal structure for a number of frames. Yes. So yeah. Feeds that, that, that you're using for the training. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And only the crystal structure. Only. Not other, uh, no. Only only crystal structure. So it's, it's purely and we and the point is also that we don't we don't we don't put any physics except for that we have the partial charts and the masses the input. Then we don't put any physics into this. It's only a CNN. And we basically just want to say can we actually somehow learn the, learn this phys physical assignment of, of secondary structure. Of us, so for intuition for atomic scales. Yeah. Can you go back to the picture that shows? Yes. Yeah, a uh, uh, one forward one. So, how big of a neighborhood should I be picturing? Ah, uh, so this is this is. Uh, so this is actually. If it's small, then I'm not going to solve. No. no. So this is actually this, this is actually the, the protein structure here is the same protein structure at, just at the same scale. So this is this is just a cartoon representation of of, uh, of a small protein, a, fu a full size uh, protein that's 50 amino acids, roughly 50 amino acids. You're capturing the entire protein inside that. No, but so this is actually the sphere placed in the C alpha of this uh, of this side chain right here. So you don't have the entire entire molecule in there. Because this is this is this is exactly the same structure. This is the sheet lying over here. This is the helix lying over here. So it's the same structure, just showing the individual uh, uh, atom positions. So you're centering the spirit, the ball at that yes. amino acid, yeah. and capturing a good chunk of the. Yes, in this case, you can.
Yes, yeah, so, so you can see, uh, so this is actually, this is the, ca the chunk that you're capturing. So you're basically not covering, you're not covering this part up here, not covering this part up here, but you can see you're covering most, you're covering both the helix and, and, and the central part of the, of the sheet right here. So th these two are, are, are exact, showing exactly the same thing, just with a different representation, of, of, and this, but the same scale of, of the protein. So this, this actually shows how, uh, with a small, with a small protein, you're, you're covering most of the protein, you're right? If you take a, a larger protein, if you take something that's 200 amino acids, then there will be a significantly smaller fraction that, that you're covering. Yes? I have a, do you use any <coughs> information about types of atoms? Like, is it, is it <coughs> aromatic carbon or aluminum? In, in this case, we don't. We just input the partial mass and, and uh, sorry, the, the, the mass and the partial charge. But you can actually do that, and that's, that's something Bauer is going to cover in, in a couple of slides. Yeah? So, uh, partial charges are derived from force fields, right? From quantum calculations. Yes, yeah. So, what, what happens if you try different force fields? We haven't tried that, but but uh, my guess is is that it, it wouldn't actually matter that much because because when you just feed in mass and partial charts, it's actually just cor corresponding to it feeding in some atom type because that's probably just what the neural network is seeing in the end. It's probably just saying, oh, we you can just see there's a number of different categories. So. Yes, we can definitely use categories instead of partial mass and partial charts. And we, all, we also tested that, and it gives approximately the same, same performance. Yes? Um, how sparse does your input data end up being? And does it is very sparse. Yeah, does that present any challenges for... Yes, yeah, so it's presenting some some uh, memory challenges because because the this box that you're inputting is so it's uh, sixty times sixty times sixty box in, in terms of number of pixels, and if you want to want to run that on on with the with the memory size of current graphics cards, that's actually a bit challenging. And and one of the thing we ha things we had to do is that that if you look at uh, if you look at our actual network here, we have this input size, so sixty times sixty times sixty, and then the, the two channels. Then when we uh, do the first 3D convolution, we're actually using striding. So when we, when we run the filter over it, we're actually skipping every sec second uh, pixel. And the reason we, we, do, we do that is actually just to, to right away downsample the input size. Because otherwise, if, if you kept, normally you wouldn't, some, some networks uh, for image recognition actually do this, but, but most of them actually keep the input size for the, first, uh, for the first convolution. But we had to do this because otherwise the batch size when we did the training would get too small. So it, so it does indeed uh, you know, give some challenges that, that you have these very, very sparse input data. Uh, so for the for the whole data set, so we used so the the whole thing was was trained on a homology reduced uh, version of, of of the protein data bank. So that's uh, how, do you remember how big? Four thousand proteins. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do any augmentation because it's not it's not obvious how to do augmentation in this case because you actually got an oriented oriented system. But we could have done we just could do, done several things to improve the improve the improve the input. That's something that, that Vauder is also going to touch upon in, in a couple of slides. Yes? Do you incorporate beta factors from UV structures that... No, we, we don't do that. We, we, could, we would definitely have done that, but we, we don't do that. But that, 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 that's a good idea. Okay, any more questions? Oh, one more question. <laughs> you said 4,000 proteins from uh, PDB? Yes, uh, yeah. Is that like a diverse set of proteins? Uh, in, Size because I, I wonder if, if your if your uh, model yeah it's it's a fairly diverse uh, uh, set in terms of, in terms of size so it's a homology reduced to to a maximum uh, homology of thirty uh. percent okay so so basically the first thing we turn to the sanity check we just want to be able to see if we can actually re recognize secondary structure because if this wouldn't work then we just uh, just as well throw out the whole network because it should be able to do this. If we do that, then we get an accuracy of around uh, 93%. So, we, so it's, a, it's a three classes, a classification problem, a helix, call a sheet. So basically, we're able to, to reconstruct the secondary structure assignment. And as, as you remember from, so this is, not, this is not secondary structure prediction because we actually, this, the secondary structure is defined based on the structure. So it's just if we can actually recognize secondary structure. And we, it looks like we can definitely recognize secondary structure. Remember, secondary structure prediction is somewhere, the maximum is, is just, just below 85%, some in the beginning of the 80s. Yes? But if I understand correctly, this is an example where sort of 
we know information theoretically one can get. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Structure. So do, do you think that the reason why this is not 100% is because of sort of the, the lens in which you're looking at the data? If you were to show the same sort of same, because you're not looking globally, right? Uh, so, so, so one thing, one thing I didn't mention here is that we actually, when we do this, we, we remove the side chain, so we make it slightly more channeling things. So we, we, in the, we actually remove the side chain from the environment. And that's probably why we don't reach the hundred percent. It's just to make it slightly more challenging because if you had the side chain, it would be very easy to, to reach a, reach hundred percent. So we basically just saying if we just look at the environment without the side chain sitting in the environment, can we actually then tell the secondary structure? Does it make sense to ask the question of what human performance is for that? Uh, that's a good question. Given yeah. how you started the talk, yeah. So, so in this thing, I think human performance wouldn't be wouldn't be particularly high because human performance here, then you would actually have to look at this this structure right here and and, and perform the secondary structure assignment. And if you did it for three D, I don't think it would be that easy to do do it with the same accuracy. So, you agree? Part of it is definition. Yeah. I think uh, in the structure, so it's a particular definition of. Of secondary structure, if you look at different assignment algorithms, they will also vary. I think within that error range, so it's I think it, it's not so interesting to go past those. I think. Those yeah. yeah. Quick question. Uh, it seems like you would, if you included all the atoms, uh, would it be kind of harder for it to figure out? Like, it doesn't really know which is the backbone atoms versus the side chain atoms. Uh, no, I, I, th I think I think if you included all the atoms, it would definitely it would definitely be easier because it would actually it would actually be able to recognize the side chain sitting in there. And I think that would definitely make. It. Could it distinguish which atoms are side chain versus backbone? Yeah, I think because because you actually because you actually have the positions in there, so you know roughly in which area the backbone atoms are going to lie because it's their oriented coordinate system. So I think it would definitely be able to recognize what's the backbone and, and what are the side chains. Okay, so, so the next thing we looked at was what if we remove the amino acid and then, then look at the void left behind the, with, with, with this amino acid, can we actually predict which amino acid would fit into that void le left behind? And if we do that, then we get, uh, we get an accuracy around 50%. So in this case, we've got, we've got uh, 20 different classes uh, of amino acids and, we, and, and in, in half, half of the cases, we actually predict, predict, predict the amino acid that we remo removed from, uh, from the structure. And again, here you can ask, shouldn't this be 100%? And, and I would argue if this was 100%, then you'd actually be, do, be doing overfitting. Because if you remove an amino acid, you'll most likely be able to fit a similar amino acid with the same biochemical properties into the same environment. So you, you definitely wouldn't expect it to, to be 100%. And in, 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 in fact, if you look at, uh, if you take a, a multiple alignment of, of homologous proteins, and then you just predict the, the most, uh, the, the most uh, frequent amino acid for, for the given position, then you get an accuracy of, of 54%. So this is actually within the very similar to what you get out of homology. The main difference here is that we don't use homologous information in these models. We basically just look at the structure. And if you look at the structure, then you get a performance that's, that's, that with, that's on, on par with what you get from, from looking at homology. I think that is actually quite remarkable that we can actually just from structure reconstruct some of the same information you get out from, from, uh, from homo homology modeling. Yes. <laughs> In this case, we remove the side chain. Because it, 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 again, I don't think we're... Pardon? All side chains. No, just, just the side chain. So basically saying if I remove the side chain and just looking at the void, because if... The surrounding environment still had the side chain. The side, surrounding environment still, still had the side chain, yes, yeah. Uh, so, and, and if you kept the side chain in there, it would be quite easy. Then, then you would definitely get uh, very close to 100%. But... but <laughs> um, so we can actually, we actually also look at this. We can actually construct a confusion matrix for this, uh, where on the x-axis right here, we got the true label for, for, the, uh, for the amino acid uh, fitting into this environment. And on y-axis, we've got the predicted, error, predicted label. And then as the values right here, we got, uh, um, we got the probability across the whole data set. So for instance, if you look at this row here, we got that the true label is glycine. And then we look across all a whole data set, what is the probability of predicting the different amino acids? And we see if you've got a glycine here, it's very likely to predict a glycine. And that makes a lot of sense because glycine is the smallest amino acid. And it's most likely that you won't be able to fit in any other amino acid in, in the small void left behind uh, for a glycine. 
the um, same is the case for, for proline, uh, sorry, uh, the same is the case for proline light here, right here. Pro proline binds back to the back chain. There is also very li likely that no, no other amino acids are, are compatible with with a, with a pro proline. If we look at um, if we look at this small box right here, it doesn't show us good up on the slide here. These are actually this is actually a full box here on on my screen right here. So these are, are slightly more colored on on my screen. This box right here, these these three amino acids in this box are all hydrophobic. Um, uh, amino acids with uh, aromatic side chains, and it makes a lot of sense that these are actually ch exchangeable with each other. This box up here, these are all uh, um, these are all po positively charged side chains, and this small box here are all uh, hydrophobic side chains. So, so we actually see some patterns we would expect in in, in a confusion matrix like this. So, qualitatively, this confusion matrix makes makes a lot of a uh, lot of sense. Another application we looked at uh, what is. Can we actually say something about the change of stability uh, if we look at uh, if we look at mutations in protein? So again, remember from from the primer, change of stability is measured by delta delta g, where we look at at the free the, the, the change in free energy for for the wild type. So basically, we calculate the free energy for the for the folded protein uh, of the wild type and the, the free energy of, of the unfolded one. Then we calculate the difference. We do the same for the wild type. And then if we, if we subtract these two, oh, there's missing deltas right here. Uh, no, sorry, it's correct. Sorry. And so so, so and then we calculate the delta delta G, and that's a measure of, of the change stability caused by, caused by mutations. And if this is a positive number, uh, it's a destabilizing mutation, and if it's a ne negative number, the mutation is, is stabilizing. So we, we, we thought, couldn't we use the numbers coming out of a neural network to say something about uh, change of stability of proteins? So first, the first thing we did was basically just a back of the envelope calculation. So we said, what can we say about the stability of, uh, of, of the wild type? Well, if we want to calculate the free energy of the folded protein, let's just look at, at the log probability of, uh, so, so imagine you have a mutation at position i in a sequence. So this is the amino acid identity at, at position i. Then we just look at the log probability of the amino acid at position i, given its surrounding environment. And then we just subtract the log frequency of, of that amino acid across our whole data set. So that's a very, very rough estimate of what the free energy could be of, 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 the, of the folded. Uh, oh, so, so, so the stability is uh, of, of the mutant. Sorry, this is going all wrong. This is a very rough estimate of, of, uh, of, uh, of the stability of, of the wild type. And we do a similar calculation for the mutant. We look at the mutated uh, amino acid sequence given the environment and subtract the log probability of, 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 uh, of the mutated uh, um, amino acid. And we subtract these two, and we get a rough estimate of, of, of the change in stability. And we, if we do that uh, across a, a, a small data set where, where we actually, where there's actually measurements of, of, of uh, change in stabilities, this is the Pearson correlation coefficients we get. We compare with the uh, two uh, state-of-the-art methods, Rosetta and Foldex, which are all uh, both, uh, both the physical force fields that are used to estimate change stability. And with this back of the envelope correlation, we get Pearson correlation coefficients that are close to Rosetta. So some, that's some cases slightly better than Rosetta, in some cases it's slightly smaller than, than, than uh, or sl slightly worse than, than Rosetta. Yes? When you replace the side chain with the other side chain, yes. um, how do you orient the new side chain and do you and so we actually don't we don't we don't place it in there. We just feed in this environment and then we look at the probability distribution coming out of a network. And that's the probabilities we feed in here. So we just say our network is basically just saying what's the probability of each of the twenty different amino acids given this environment without a side chain in there. So that's, this probability is just is actually with the void in there, so we don't fill in the side chain. But you could definitely look at filling in the side chain and doing doing, doing something that's more advanced. Um, the problem with this back of the envelope calculation is, of course, that that the scale is most likely totally off. So we get decent decent uh, decent uh, Pearson correlation coefficients, but if we looked at the mean average error, the, the 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 quantities are of course quite quite off. So we all actually looked in, couldn't you actually learn how to do this calculation instead? So the idea is basically that we, we feed this environment without the amino acid into our network, we get out this probability distribution that we did, we used to, uh, we, 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 uh, we used in, in this, uh, this back of the envelope calculation. And remember, we trained this network on the whole PDB. 
uh, or, or the etymology reduced version of the PD, PDP. The idea is then, then we use a small neural network to do this calculation of, of, of change sensibility. The idea is that we feed in the, the two same probabilities of, 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 the, of the amino acid and the mutated amino acid given the environment, and we also feed in the, in the back, background frequency of these. We also feed in the identi identity of, of the uh, wild type amino acid and, and, and the mutant amino acid. Uh, and then we train this small network on, um, on, on the change of stability data set. That's only, uh, only these thousand, um, uh, thousand observations. And of course, we do cross-validation. So, so when we train our network, we don't have the mutations in there that we're trying to predict in, 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 in our test set. So this is actually some kind of, uh, this is actually some version of transfer learning. So the idea is that we can sort of imagine that we're using this network to learn general features about, about environments, and then we're using this network, we're feeding out the, 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 what's coming out of the first network into a smaller network that, that we're then training on for, specific, for solving a more specific task. And if we do this, we get some results that are remarkably better. So we added a column over here where we have the 3D CNN plus the small neural network of multi-layer perception. And the, generally, the tendency is that we actually get state-of-the-art performance. We get Pearson correlation coefficients that are very close to the one by Foltex, in some cases, uh, slightly better. So it actually means that we're, we're able to predict change of stability uh, at, at state-of-the-art, with state-of-the-art performance, without feeding any physical knowledge into, into our prediction method. Yes? Yeah, quick question. And so did you also try then take results, like say, Rosetta or Foldex, and equivalent values, and also try uh, so, uh, also taking the results, let's say, from Rosetta or Foldex for the mutation and mutant, like the same information that you would have extracted from the 3D CNN. Yes. And then also do, let's say, learn a way to compute uh, delta. Uh, so, so, adding, so basically adding a multilayer perception on top of, uh, on top of Foldex. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. So the question would be like, what part of it is gained just because you've now learned a different way to compute PDG? Uh, Ah, so, so I mean, I mean, th this is the actual gain. So this is the actual gain of of actually just adding this multi-layer perception. That that's what you see from this column to so this column over here. No, because because Foldex is actually already is already just trained on this data set. So actually, so so it's already they already done done a similar task for Foldex to get these this this performance. So so I don't think you would gain anything by doing a similar thing to, to Foldex. And actually, we're not even, it's not actually un, even unclear for Foldex if there's an overlap between what we use for the test set and, and, and what they, they use for their training set. So there might be some overlap, whereas at least our, we know, we're sure that our result, there's no overlap between training and, and test set. But, but we think this is still a fair comparison. And the last thing I'm going to, to show is, the, is that, that we can also construct a confusion matrix for, for, do, for this change, uh, change sensibility. We've got the wild type here, we've got the mutant right here, and this is the, the arrow measured in kilocal per mole. And the general, general tendency uh, we see is that if we, we and, oh, and the amino acids are, are ordered small to large in this case, and generally what we see is that if we substitute a small amino acid to, to, for, with a small amino acid, then we get lower arrows, whereas we, when we substitute a large amino acid for a large one, then, then we get higher arrows. And that's, at least qual qualitatively, this makes, makes uh, entropic sense in the sense that, that you've got, you got a lot of more things that you can mess up if, you, if, you're, putting in, if you're replacing a large amino acid with, with a large amino acid. Yes? Uh, why are a few of the on-diagonal terms non-zero? Uh, a few of them, which is like a little bit of green color. Like I think that implies that replacing something with itself. Yeah, so that, that's actually, that's, that's something that, that's, uh, uh, that's actually a good question. Those, the, all, the, all, all the diagonals should actually be zero. But in this case, so in this case, uh, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> they should, all, all the diagonals should actually be zero. Um, yes? All right, so that was my part, part of the talk, and then I'm going to, to give it all to Wouter. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll figure this out. Uh, yes. <laughs> Isn't it because the, the top a multi-layer perceptron doesn't necessarily have to be an identity function when you plug in the same inputs in the two? Uh, so th in, this, in, in this case, I mean, there's there got to be something in the data set that way if you've got a mutation where you put in the, you put in the same <laughs> Be but it could be that the real data is 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 zero, but that we yeah. yes, yeah. That's, uh, 
I think the real question is, why would anyone do the experiment, right? So, so I think there must be some, yeah. Codon usage. So sorry? Is it related to codon usage? Um, well, the error is something on the diagonal? Yes. Um, I think it's... Changing the I don't know. I, I don't. I, I I don't know what I, I can speculate. But you have a solution. Is, is your your zero is yellow, right? So the, aren't the whites just nans probably? And that, ah, but the problem is that the diagonal should all be white. Yeah, so we don't know but isn't your your zero, oh, yes, your zero is yellow, not white? So isn't it just? It's probably it's like a plotlib nand thing or something. Yeah, probably the white ones are nans and the and the yellow ones are zeros. And what's the <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay, so we were pretty happy about this result. We were sort of patting ourselves on the back that this is pretty neat. We, we, came, we made this nice neural network to this prediction, and we got state-of-the-art performance without really knowing much about the problem domain, uh, for, for, at least for DDG predictions. So these other methods, they have decades of, uh, of development in force fields, which we don't use, and it seems that you can learn some, you can get similar performance by just plugging in these things in a neural network and training it on directly on data. So we were pretty happy about that. Um, but then we discovered, um, okay, so this idea of using uh, image analysis tools for doing protein structure analysis, a lot of people got that same idea around the same time. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned this in the primer as well. Uh, so we saw a number of, of, of applications of basically the exact same, same idea on, on, on various tasks in, in computational structure biology. For instance, predicting binding sites, as I mentioned, or predicting the affinity between a ligand and a protein, um, uh, or, um, or something that's actually very close to what we're doing is considering local environments around uh, amino acids, um, or, or calculating, or considering the overall shape of enzymes and classifying them into specific groups. Um, so in all these cases, um, so there are some minor differences, and I'll just go over them in the, in the coming, or the slides after this, uh, in, in the choice of representations, getting back to some of the questions that were here earlier. But overall, it, it shows that you can, you can just use the, take some published architecture from image analysis, change the input representation, uh, train on some specific data set from, from uh, some structural biology data set, and, and get very reasonable results in many cases. All right, so um, one thing that I would like to touch upon, which is mentioned in one of these papers, um, which is sort of a big thing in, it's becoming a big thing in image analysis, is interpretability of these models. So, so can you, given that you, you have a neural network and you make a particular prediction, can you then afterwards try to understand why the model made this particular uh, prediction uh, for a particular task? And there's a recent paper out by, uh, by uh, sort of a re review over these uh, these activities by uh, Klaus uh, Robert Müller, which is really worth um, a read if you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, but the general idea uh, is that just as normally when you you update the parameters in a network, you do that by uh, by backpropagation, so where you can calculate the, the the partial derivative of any parameter with respect to the loss. You can also backpropagate all the way to the input and ask the question, which of my uh, or how sensitive is this particular input pixel, uh, or if I change this particular input pixel, how much will that, that affect this particular prediction I'm making? And, and in that way, you can go through your entire image and you can do a sensitivity analysis and, uh, and see which, which pixels are the most important in my in, input for this particular prediction that I'm making. Um, and, um, and one of these papers that I, I mentioned previously, uh, they did this. So they, they solved a very similar task to us. They removed the, the, uh, a particular side chain and then looked at the microenvironment around it and then made predictions about the identity of that, of that amino acid. But then they looked at this sensitivity analysis um, uh, or, or this, in, this interpretability um, by then backpropping and figuring out which of the, uh, the, the atoms in my inputs uh, the atoms in my input were responsible for this prediction. So they took a couple of cases where the model made a correct prediction and looked at which atoms were, were essential for this prediction. And then, uh, and these are highlighted in, in, according to that color scale over here. And then they show a couple of examples where there are very specific atoms that were, that, that were, that, that were determinant for this particular, um, for this particular uh, uh, prediction. And then they show that these, 
these make sense biophysically. So uh, for, for various, or, or biochemically, for various uh, reasons, so for instance, charge uh, complementarity and other reasons made these atoms particularly important at that, uh, at that position. So I just, I just included this slide to make the point that, that um, historically, Neural networks have sometimes been considered as black, black box methods. So you train them on data and then you use them for prediction, but you don't really know what's going on. And I think that view is sort of slowly being faded out now that people are starting to, to consider neural networks as, as interpretable, mo interpretable models using techniques like these. You can actually go back for a particular prediction and analyze what the neural network is seeing and which particular features in the input it's, are, are essential for, for, for the output. Um, right. Okay, so, so we have this basic setup now. We, we've shown that you can use convolutional neural networks to do these types of predictions. Um, so can you improve on this? Can you, can, you, can you become even better at doing feature detection? Um, and uh, I'll just start by illustrating a few of the differences in these, in these papers that I listed before. And one is coming back to the question over uh, from the audience before is, can't you just look at atom types as categories uh, instead of considering the mass, mass and the partial charge? And several of these papers have actually done this. Uh, so, for instance, uh, so um, for instance, considering just uh, uh, the standard atom types which you would expect in a protein, so oxygen and carbon and nitrogen and sulfur, uh, and each of these would then be a separate input channel to the network, uh, and the rest is, is basically the same as we described before. Uh, but you would just get different input images for these different atom types. Um, and this, we also tried that for our model, and it works, it gives the same performance as doing this uh, mass and partial charge. And it's, e it's even uh, easier to implement, and you, you also get rid of this, the, this, as you also, I think you mentioned, that in principle you're still using force field data to, for the partial charge, and you really want to get rid of that dependency, and it doesn't really seem to matter, but it's a good check that it's nice to see that it, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, and some people also use extended atom type uh, sets where you look at atom types in particular, particular local environments. And uh, so there are various ways to do this. Uh, yes? Just going back to the previous point, yeah. Yeah. Just for, I feel like I must be missing something about what you were trying to say because to me the definition of a black box is exactly the kind of function where I have to perturb each little element of my input in order to have any idea what it's doing. Like you could do that with any black box function, right? You can perturb a little bit of the input, see yeah, yeah. how that changes the output, yeah, yeah. and that would tell you something about what this black box is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't change the fact that it's a black box and you have no idea without yeah. knowing, you know, without changing <laughs> your box. Right, no, no, so the difference is that you don't have to do the actual perturbation. You have the partial derivatives, right? So you actually know how much, uh, I mean, you can calculate these quantities directly. You don't, so but yes, I guess that's a small difference, but it is a difference that you can, you can calculate the effect for a given pixel, what is the effect of the output without having to do it. But that's the difference between sort of analytical differentiation and, and numerical differentiation. Uh, but, but isn't, yeah. Um, so you have some, you can sort of estimate the partial at every point or something like that. Right. right? And, 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 and I think it's a really difficult way of understanding what the function is doing from a kind of a analytic point of view, right? Like you're, you have some picture of it, but it's still, right. but you don't have to recompute at any point you're saying. Right. Uh, yes, I, I, I see your point. But you can also, so there's also a lot of work at analyzing sort of feature maps uh, uh, in, in between, so in the middle of the network, you can also analyze them and understand sort of what the model is seeing at different stages of abstraction through the model, and pe people are also working on that. So there's a lot of work in trying to, to take apart the black box and understand its components in various ways. And this was just looking at the input, the effect of the input, but you can also look at the, re the representations that are being learned at different stages and try to understand them. But I, s I, s I appreciate your point. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, Good, so um, another, um, another representation decision that you have to make is, what is when you have these, all these atom positions, you have to decide how you want to represent them in a, uh, in a grid. So what you typically do is you grid up the st structure, and what we did is just take the most simple solution. We, if, if an atom occurs within a certain voxel, then we just uh, mark that voxel with the mass and the partial charge in our case. Um, but you can do, uh, you can do uh, slightly, uh, yeah. So, Doing this, you certainly set a, a, a lower limit to the resolution you can get, which is determined by the, the grid. Um, so there are slightly different ways we can get sort of super resolution is by placing small 
uh, Gaussians or some, some other uh, basic distribution on each of your atom positions and work with densities uh, instead. So where each voxel then is the density of the, of the atoms uh, occurring in that region. This in principle allows you to have some information about where the individual atoms occur within a bin. And you could then incorporate, for instance, B factors or something like that to, to, to reflect the uncertainty that you have. Um, right. Um, so one thing we looked at particularly was whether uh, a, a, a Cartesian representation for this grid was, was really the, the, the optimum. Um, because we've both been working with molecular simulations, molecular force fields for many years. And, and if you look at how interactions between atoms are parameterized in these molecular force fields, they're all distance based. Uh, so to us, it made more sense to work with a spherical rep or to work with a representation where the radial component was sort of explicitly represented. Um, so we looked at various ways to do this. Um, and the simplest way to think about a sort of a, concent a, a concentric representation is standard uh, spherical polar coordinates. Um, so we, we, we tried that. The problem with this, this type of coordinate system is that you have a non-regular grid. Uh, so you see that as you approach the poles here, the, 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 the voxels become smaller and smaller. And this means that you lose one of the essential properties of these CNNs, which is this equivariance property that you can apply the, fil the same filter, different parts of your input image, and get the same uh, response. So they see a very different uh, volume up here as down here. So this is not optimal. Um, and so uh, instead, we also tried to circumvent this. We tried, we came up with a different representation, which is a cubed sphere representation where you take the sphere and inscribe a cube and then project on the, on the, on the sides of the cube and have a regular grid there. So you get rid of this, these, these weird artifacts at the poles and you exchange that with some artifacts at these, at these corners. And we tried both these representations, well, mainly just to see if the, this change of representation, uh, even though we knew that it was, it was not perfect and we lost equivariance equ to some extent, whether it, it gave an improvement or not. Um, and working with these representations, an important thing is that you still want to be able to implement it efficiently on a GPU. And we show that this, you can actually do this because you can take this for each uh, spherical shell, you can, you, can, uh, you can unfold this cube and you can do convolutions independently on all the faces of the cube. And you just need to keep track of, of uh, doing the right padding uh, for each of these faces. So you, you, you map the, 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 how the how, so you map the neighborhood correctly at these edges. So there are some technical details, but you can do this. And if we then do the same, oh, sorry? Just a quick question. How yes. does this compare to using like an actual cube, like just a, like a square cube? Uh, as to like using a complex spherical. Ah, right, oh, right, right, okay, sorry, yes. So you're asking if we didn't, if, if we didn't cut off these, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this was, um, um, this was a decision we had in order to be able to compare these uh, fairly. Uh, to, to make a fair comparison so we knew that we had exactly the same information. And also, if you have a, a full cube, then it becomes very dependent on the orientation that you choose. So, uh, so we wanted to avoid those effects. Uh, I, uh, I don't think we've done rigorous comparison testings, but normally in molecular force fields, this 12, 12 Ångström uh, cutoff is considered as containing most of the information in the local environment. So we haven't, but we haven't done rigorous testing for that, but that's a good, good point. Um, right, so if we then, do a prediction, the, the exact same prediction that, that Yes talked about before and looked at how good are we are predicting the particular amino acid at the center of our cube. We actually do see uh, a, a substantial improvement by switching to this, other, this concentric representation. Uh, and so our, our hypothesis was that features are more naturally expressed in, in, in these concentric uh, shells and that turns out to be correct despite the fact that we have some problems with equivariance here. So there's not, it's not as data efficient. Uh, it has to learn the same patterns uh, several times, but, um, but still we get a, um, a reasonable uh, performance improvement. Right. So ideally, um, you can imagine how this model works, what types of things it's seeing, but you would think that in order to, to, to to make predictions about protein structure, you would have to recognize certain uh, interactions between atoms, for instance, uh, uh, disulfide bonds or hydrogen bonds. Uh, and you would, you would need to do that in all different types of orientations. And I, as I briefly touched upon in the primer, what you really want is that you want, you want to have rotational equivariance in these types of models so that you can take, you can recognize features in any orientation, but keep track of which orientation you saw them in. Um, 
And um, so uh, also, as I mentioned in the primer, uh, this, this, was, uh, this work was sort of pioneered by um, Terko Cohen and Max Welling, where they looked at how you construct convolutional networks for particular symmetry groups by building in the structure of the group directly uh, into the model. And I also said that this doesn't really scale to the types of groups we're interested in where we want full sort of continuous rotations. Uh, and, um, and then I mentioned that, uh, that what we really uh, wanted or where the field was moving was, was, uh, was that you could use the steerable, the idea of steerable filters where you can predict the response uh, of filters based on that. You can have a fixed set of, of basis filters and you can combine them in ways so uh, you, can, you can construct any rotation of these filters and predict the response for them. And there's been a, uh, just over the last year, uh, a number of publications on this. So uh, again, Taco Cohen and Max Willing uh, uh, published sort of the foundations for the theoretical considerations on how you, how you make sure that you, uh, how you can do this in a neural network. We have repeated layers um, and how you, can, um, how you can construct completely steerable CNNs. And there have been a couple of interesting applications in 2D. And I'll just highlight this uh, harmonic networks paper and just give a few examples. Um, so, um, so the basic idea is that, so as you're uh, so in this harmonics, this is really a very nice reference. I can re recommend if you're interested in this sort of thing to read this paper um, because it gives a net, very nice overview of these, these concepts. So uh, the idea is that you construct a basis set uh, uh, from circular harmonics. Um, we have a radial component and an angular component. Um, and the, the central idea now is that you can, as I mentioned, and this is basically the same figure that yes presented for translational equivariance, but now for, for rotational transformations of the input. So the idea is if you have some input here and you apply some rotation operator, so you get a rotated image, and then apply a convolution, you will get some response here. Um, and uh, if, you, uh, if you instead now do the, uh, the convolution, and then can we then somehow from this predict what the response will be, uh, uh, transform the feature map that we get out of the untransformed case uh, to, to the same as if we had input, uh, rotated the input directly? And the answer is yes, uh, using this spherical basis and uh, you can, or this um, circular harmonics basis, you can then you can then exactly figure out how, uh, which transformation to apply to the feature map to get the, the same feature map back. Clarify, your, yes. your basis set, do you train on that or you, that's, so the basis set? Uh, yeah, so the basis set is, uh, so in this particular, there are various ways of doing it. In this particular example, in this, they train, uh, they train the, uh, the, the offsets, the angular offsets, and then they train this, uh, the, uh, the radial components, uh, the functional form of the radial component. The, 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 the input basis layers, they are fixed. Right, so you, have, you decide on some number of, order of these M orders of, and, and then you use them for, uh, so it's sort of similar to deciding on a number of channels when you do a, a convolutional network. So you decide on a certain, how rich you want your representation to be and then you work with, with those, yes. Yes? I'm not that familiar, but I'm imagining now like if you had a rotation of the cat's face in the image, like yeah, yeah. an upside down cat, is it the same kind of issue now like that you are inefficient about learning upside down cat faces or is that not the case? Yeah, so like, in, in I mean, you can learn translations, but rotations are difficult in the other world, and so this is kind of the flip side of that. Yeah, so this is the, no, this is a, this is a very good point. So this is exactly for a standard CNN. What you're saying is exactly true. That if you have, if you rec know how to recognize cats, if you then flip a cat on its side, the model would have no idea that it's a cat anymore. And the idea here is that in principle, you can learn the essential features of a cat, and then you would be able to recognize it in different orientations. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, so, yeah, so these networks uh, sort of, yeah, so translational equivariance is built into all these networks uh, sort of automatically by the way you structure the input. Yes, so you still do sliding filtering. So you, you get that. So you, you, yes, yes, right. Um, so, so the main challenge here is to ensure that you can maintain steerability throughout all layers of the network. And, in, uh, and so the, this, as you can see on the slide prior, so the, the, the way you transform the feature map is dependent on the order of the filters or the frequency of the, of the filter. So uh, depending on which of these filters you have, your, your response will rotate more or less quickly. Um, and so 
in order for that to, to work throughout the network, you have to separate these orders uh, in a particular way so that they still become easily steerable uh, at all levels downstream. So what, what they do is they separate into, into these different orders and keep track of that, that you don't mix up these signals. Um, and and this, is, this is described in great detail here. And the general theory uh, is developed in this steerable CNN paper about uh, uh, it's, it's basically an exercise in representation theory in how you can, uh, how you can write this up. And this is not my, uh, my field of expertise, so uh, I won't, I won't <laughs> try to introduce you to that concept. But, it's, uh, but it seems to work uh, really uh, well. And here's just an, an example from this harmonics uh, or a spherical, uh, this harmonical nets paper where they use a standard CNN and they rotate an image and they look at a particular patch in the image and how the the features that they see uh, change depending on this rotation. And then they have this rotational equivariant net and they look at the same. And I'll just zoom into these two, uh, these two uh, feature maps representations. So you see that, so these, um, and of course during training, this data set has been augmented so it's presented with all rotations. So the, the standard CNN has been able to learn all these different rotations, but it still has to, you can see that it's still a little bit uncertain. It has to learn to combine these or learn these filters, filters over and over again for different orientations, while this rotational equivariant net can reuse them directly. Uh, so it's much more stable to these, to these rotations. Okay, so now, of course, the big question is, can we do this in 3D? Um, and and uh, a couple of months ago, the answer was, we don't know, we have no idea. Uh, but now, just in the last few months, three papers have come out that, are, that tried to do this. Uh, so this, uh, this tensor field networks and n-body networks both, with both work with continuous input, so without voxelizing the input. Uh, and then there's been one paper uh, called CubeNet, which does it on, on sort of voxelized data, which is comparable to what we do, but only for, for sort of uh, discrete flips of, 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 uh, um, of 90 degree rotations. Um, Right, and so uh, this is, and all these, none of these papers are published yet, they're all on archive and it's very interesting to see what's going on in this field now uh, and, and where we'll end up. Um, and I've also, in a collaboration with these, uh, with uh, uh, Taco Cohen and Max Willing, um, I've, I also approached them to see if we could do something about this for proteins and, and, and they've been working on an, on an equivalent on the generalization of these harmonic nets. And so we've, we've just started looking at this now. Uh, and we have some, some very preliminary results uh, where I just tried to take our Cartesian networks from before and then replace the convolution. Oh, yes. And we'll replace the convolution operators in this standard Cartesian net network with these steerable convolutions instead. Um, and then, uh, and, and not optimizing the network in any way. Uh, so obviously more improvements can be gained, but, but even just doing that, we get an improvement over this 0.56. Um, with these, with these uh, rotational equivariant networks. So this seems to be really promising. So without just using a standard, not now just using a standard Cartesian representation, so not this complicated spherical one, but now because it can learn these rotational equivariant filters, we actually do see an improvement. Okay, I just want to, last few minutes, I just want to mention one more application because it's really uh, quite interesting, I think. Um, so in some sense, this amino acid environment is a little bit artificial because the images are always oriented in exactly the same way. Uh, and this means that we don't, we don't necessarily need all that much uh, rotational equivariance. So to test the model really, uh, we came up with a different data set, which is try and see, take the CAF data set, which is this uh, database of, of structural, is a, is a classification of protein structure in different levels of structural, uh, different structures, stru structural resolution. And we decided to look at the architecture level, which is basically secondary structure and, it's, and how they're organized, and try to see whether we could predict from structure which which of these classes it, it belonged to. So we constructed a balanced data set of these. Um, and although they look quite different on this initial slide, it, you would imagine it's not so different to recognize the difference between these two. But if you look within these classes, you actually see that the structures within each of these classes is really quite different. So it's sort of on the verge of, doing, of, of, um, of transfer learning where you need to just in order to recognize that these all belong to the same class, actually you need to recognize both secondary structure and how it's organized with respect to, to one another. And if we look here again, if we do standard 3D CNNs and compare that to the steerable CNNs, we, we, see, a, we see a dramatic, substantial improvement in, in performance again. Um, so, um, uh, and we have much better, better data efficiency in these models and we have 
uh, only a factor, so we have a, a factor 100 less parameters in these models as well compared to the standard CNN. So it's, uh, it's really quite nice. All right, great. So I just wanted to conclude with, uh, with, with one uh, application where we actually use these types of models to say something about sequence variation, uh, which I thought might be of interest to some of you. So we actually use it in practice. Um, so one thing we've been looking at is, uh, uh, so we're looking at cellular hubs, so proteins that interact with a whole bunch of other proteins uh, through, through a specific binding site. So we're looking at PCNA, which interacts with, with hundreds of binding partners. Um, so PCNA is this protein here, it's a homotrimer, uh, and, and these proteins, they bind through a particular motif here on, on the surface. And there's several complexes have been solved with this protein with these binding partners, and they all bind in roughly the same way uh, with a sort of a partially formed helix here, and then they can be shorter or longer. But if you look at the sequence of these motifs, uh, uh, you, uh, so, so, yeah, so the interaction is defined in terms of uh, what is typically called the short linear motif, so short stretch here, um, and, and the standard way of characterizing such slims is, is by specifying for each position here what the different amino acids uh, are likely to be. And for this case, we have a, a that's a glutamine, and then we have, um, uh, we have a hydrophobic in the, in the middle, and in the end we have two uh, aromatics. Uh, but if you look in the, in, the, in, the, in the database of all these, or just look through the sequences of these interaction partners, you see that there's actually quite a bit of variation in, in, in the sequences of these motifs. Um, and, and the question is, why, why do we see such, uh, such variations? And what is really essential for, for this binding? Can we somehow uh, understand that? Um, and the, the problem is that many of these short linear motifs are defined uh, from the literature of just, just a handful of examples of known interacting partners, but that means the statistics for the sequence uh, is not very good. So you, you never really know how, how much you can trust these motifs. So we decided to look at it from, the, from a, a different angle and, and just look at the structure. Since we know for PCNA, we know the structure of, of PCNA bound in complex with these binding partners, whether we can just, from that structure, whether we can predict, if we look at these, uh, on this interface, this complex here, whether for, we, for each position in these, these binding partners, could predict what the, what the most probable amino acids wa were, and whether this in any way corresponded to what was known from the sequence databases. Um, so it's sort of a, an orthogonal approach to the same thing. Either you look directly in, in evolution, or you just look so we just trained them all on all of the structural data available and looked in general what are the structural preferences. And there uh, you see, so we then construct a multiple average over these structural models and then doing these predictions, we see that we had a logo like this, which actually behaves very much like the sequence signal that we had before. So we indeed see that there's a strong signal for, some, for, for a hydrophobic in the center position. And we see that we have, uh, we have these aromatics uh, appearing at the end. Uh, so what we don't see is this, so this is the sequence motif known from the, uh, the database. So we don't see the glutamine in the beginning as being very uh, highly preferred. Um, and, and, in, and this, you can speculate, of course, our model doesn't see all details, and uh, so it's basically uh, sort of an average over, and mostly considering sort of overall stability. Um, but, um, and, and glutamine does appear here, but also if you look in the sequences, not all of these motifs actually have a glutamine there. So, so it seems to, to maybe not be, be, be essential. Um, and, and we're now looking, uh, so we're working with, uh, with, with experimentalists to try and do mutations here to see, to understand these, these relationships uh, better. But this is just an indication of, of an actual application of the, of the model. Um, and with that, I uh, would like to uh, uh, conclude uh, the talk and uh, thank you for your attention.